Hello, uh, my name is Richard Capps and my purpose here is to make a short introductory video on the subject of project finance. Now, do not fall into the trap of thinking that the financing of a project is project finance. Project finance is a technical term and I want to start off by illustrating the two distinctive features that you find in project finance that is not present in normal company finance. Look, uh, for example, at this diagram. Uh, you see that uh, we have an investment, let's say one billion dollar uh, project investment. Uh, let us imagine that it's a multinational corporation, um, Royal Dutch Shell, let's say, uh, and we could choose to finance this billion dollar project corporately. Uh, it, it would be very quick, it would be very cheap, and it would be very simple. Uh, because there would be only three documents, uh, uh, types of documents involved. There would be a loan agreement, uh, some security documentation, uh, and some cross guarantees. I'm sure more than one company in the world that shelter will be involved. Uh, three very simple, straightforward documents that any self respecting law firm uh, could sump out in an afternoon. Uh, and then we spend the next uh, five or six weeks negotiating the commercial terms and conditions. Um, the alternative is that we could undertake this project as a limited recourse financing. The investment's the same, the billion dollar project, uh, but this time the borrower will not be the company, it will be a project entity. Now, sometimes during the course uh, of this program, uh, sometimes I use the terminology project entity, sometimes special purpose vehicle. Um, I mean the same thing, they're synonymous terms. Uh, the project entity will be the borrower. Uh, and then when we bring the financing in, you'll notice that the sponsors, um, sponsor is the jargon term for the equity behind the special purpose vehicle. Uh, sponsors plural, because I'm sure the majority of projects that you get involved with, there's a consortium of companies. It doesn't have to be, it could be a single company. Uh, and they, are no, they do not stand between the financing uh, and the SPV. They're out to one side with a dotted line saying limited recourse. And by limited recourse, we mean limited in one of three ways. Limited in scope and or amount and or time. By scope, I mean there may be full recourse to the sponsors for certain things. Uh, for example, an environmental event like Cervezo, Bhopal, Three Mile Island. You know, if something of this sort occurs, maybe it's arranged that the sponsors stand fully behind the SPV uh, or the project entity for this. Maybe the construction phase of the project is very awkward um, because of logistics uh, or technology or something of this sort. And the debt financiers do not feel comfortable unless they have recourse to creditworthy sponsors. So that's what I mean by limited in scope. And or it may be limited in amount. For example, it may be agreed that the first $25 million of problem, no matter what the cause, is for the account of the sponsors. Uh, in which case, sure enough, but if the problems are greater than 25 million, the sponsors have no legal liability whatsoever, uh, nor do uh, the lenders, unless they have put in place standby uh, financing lines. Nobody has legal liability, but everybody has too great a vested interest to simply abandon the project. 
So everybody goes into a smoke-filled smoke room, oh, they used to be smoke-filled, I assume they still are, uh, and nobody has legal liability, but everybody has a common purpose to try and salvage this project on some negotiated basis or other. And there's no rules to that game, uh, it depends on who the personalities are in the room, the facts of the individual case and so on. Thirdly, uh, it may be limited in time. In the vast majority of project financings, uh, the most difficult part is getting the infrastructure built and working. Once you have it built and it works, the chances that it'll suddenly stop working is highly unlikely unless this political interference risk uh, or macroeconomic risk. Um, and therefore, the debt financiers who have limited recourse um, tend to want more support in that very difficult early stage of construction and commissioning uh, and will ordinarily allow the recourse to fall to lower levels or fall away completely uh, at a later time for the long operating tail uh, of the project. And therefore, uh, limited uh, in scope and or amount and or time. The second distinguishing feature of project financing, um, you know, other than the limitation of the recourse, uh, is the role of this project entity. Now, I call it an entity, not a company, because although it might be a company, it equally might be something else. It could be a trust, it could be a partnership, it could be an unincorporated joint venture, it could be a number of different legal animals. But no matter what its legal status, the one thing that it will always have in common is that there's only a single source of revenue. There's only one cash flow uh, developed uh, from this single piece of industrial infrastructure, this power plant, this desalination plant, uh, this coal mine, uh, you know, uh, the, this uh, telecoms project. Uh, there could be two income streams, a copper and zinc, nickel and cobalt, oil and gas. But even where there are two income streams, they are usually umbilically linked. Therefore, if there is a problem with the underlying project, both of your cash flows are similarly affected. Now, if you put these two ideas together, uh, the idea that you have only a single cash flow, uh, and secondly, that you have very limited recourse to creditworthy sponsors. Then if I'm the debt financier, and I'm putting up 80%, let's say, of the financial capital of this project, uh, for me, it's a bit like walking across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. You have only a single tightrope of cash flow uh, to support the financing. And beneath this tightrope, there is no safety net. There is no recourse. In other words, if anything goes wrong, there is nothing to stop me smashing on the rocks beneath. And therefore, if I'm putting up $800 million for this $1 billion project, uh, there are two questions that I want to have answered. Question number one is, is this tightrope attached to the other side. Because as soon as you step foot onto this tightrope, you can't change your mind and go back. Once you take $800 million of my cash and convert it into illiquid infrastructure assets, I can't be repaid other than from the cash flow generated by these assets over the next 30 years. And therefore I need to satisfy myself that once I get on the rope, I can get off the rope at the end. In other words, I need to do the four big due diligences that you always need to do in a project financing. Uh, specific projects may have specific areas of due diligence, but the four, if you like, generic areas of due diligence is first of all, technical due diligence. What gives me the confidence as a lender that I really understand the technical issues associated with this project. The ability of this infrastructure 
to generate that volume of output uh, to that quality specification consistently year after year with what degradation, with what maintenance cost, uh, and so on. Now these are technical questions. Um, now of course I have the technical feasibility study supplied, uh, supplied by the sponsors, the Royal Dutch Shell in my example, but I can't entirely rely on that. Uh, they have a conflict of interest. These sponsors benefit from my lending uh, and therefore I really need to have independent verification of the technical issues associated with the project. Now lenders that do a lot of project finance will have on their staff um, technical people, they'll have petroleum geologists, they'll have civil engineers, people who used to work in the power generation industry and so on. Uh, people who can objectively uh, assess and identify the issues uh, associated with the technical aspects of, of the project. And if you don't have it in-house, on board, uh, you'll need to hire it in on a consultancy basis, deal by deal. The second generic area of due diligence is marketing due diligence. Why as a lender would I necessarily understand the supply-demand equation for whatever the product or service of this project is? Now I, I understand what the market is now, but five years from now, ten years, fifteen years from now, with changing technologies, changing demographics, changing politics, um, and uh, again I might need some external support to assist me identify uh, over the next 25 or 30 years uh, what those uh, supply demand parameters might look like. The third uh, area of generic due diligence is legal due diligence. As many of you will know, these projects are in fact a spider's web of contracts. And there's no point in having a contract unless you have reasonable prospects of enforcing your rights under those contracts. Um, and now, of course, if it's a domestic project, you know, if I'm a British bank lending to a British borrower for a, UK, a project in the UK using English law, uh, then if things start to go off the rails, if things go wrong, one has a fairly good idea of uh, you know, how the uh, contractual arrangements can be enforced. But in cross-border transactions, where you've got a number of parties from, yeah, 20 parties, all from different jurisdictions, uh, using different uh, laws for different contracts, uh, so conflict of law issues, cross-border enforcement issues, uh, things are no longer straightforward. Uh, and therefore, I, I have never seen a clean uh, legal due diligence. There are always issues. Um, uh, sometimes we can get around these issues by commercial structures. I'm going to have you perform first, I'll perform second, so if you don't perform I'm in a stronger position. Maybe I want security for your performance. I want you to post a bank letter of credit or put up physical security uh, so that if you don't perform, I, I don't go against you with law, I just grab your assets and compensate myself. Maybe that's not possible on the particular facts. Uh, but is it a deal breaker? Um, only you can be the judge of what is a deal breaker on a case by case basis. Um, so legal due diligence. The fourth due diligence is the most <coughs> is the most important of all. If we have only a single cash flow, um, then maybe we had better sit down uh, and define what this single cash flow looks like and build ourselves a project cash flow model. In other words, financial due diligence is number four. Uh, this uh, cash flow model will identify whether the single cash flow, the tightrope across Niagara Falls, whether that tightrope is strong enough to support the weight of the financing that is going to be walking across it. Now the model is a synth synthesis of all of the other due diligence. Everything we know about how the technical uh, performance of the project works, what the supply demand equation is that turns that asset infrastructure into a cash flow, and when we know how the law works under a variety of different possible future outcomes and scenarios, um, then we can identify 
the strength of this single cash flow. Now I said that there are two questions that I want to have answered. Question number one, remember, is the tightrope strong enough to support the weight of the financing? But when you walk across a tightrope, there's a second way that you can die. The first way is obvious, the rope breaks, it's not strong enough to support the weight. But there is a second way that you can die, that the rope is plenty strong enough. But how much is it going to swing around in the wind uh, as we're walking across? In other words, how volatile is this single cash flow? And so I now want to turn my attention uh, to the volatility of the single project cash flow.